Yeah, the topic I'm going to talk to you about is robotics in ocular surgery. And I've been working on this for quite a few years now, probably about close to 14. So you've already heard from Adnan that people are worried about the fact that robots are going to take over uh, jobs. And, and robots have been part of our lives for a very long time. I mean, in terms of industrial robots, they've been around uh, since about the 1980s. And they've taken over uh, large parts of heavy industry and areas where uh, there is a risk associated with humans. We also accept them usually uh, quite easily when it, uh, it is uh, used to be an assistive device where it helps with cognitive development, providing you with body support or prosthesis if you require them. And um, it's also used for telepresence. And in all of these applications, they in fact enhance our abilities without essentially trying to replace them. Now, with regards to surgery, it's been around since about uh, 2020. And uh, the first such robot really that has uh, dominated the market was the Da Vinci robot. It's a massive device, which is used essentially for uh, abdominal surgery and uh, a lot less with, it has been tried for ophthalmic microsurgery, but if you look at its massive size, it's not necessarily adapted to our specific use. So coming back to the questions that were asked is, does this technology solve a problem and in particular for ophthalmology? Well, there are several problems. One of which I've just indicated to you is the size of the device. And what we need is something that is non-intrusive, which fits essentially in existing ORs rather than, than having to build a new one. Something which in my opinion is important is where the surgeon remains in control and doesn't give everything over back to a, a robotic system so that we don't end up with a uh, Boeing 7 uh, Max 8. You want something that the uh, uh, surgeon can use for assigned tasks in a controlled standardized fashion where he essentially becomes better than what he's able to do today. So looking at vitreoretinal surgery, this is the device that we've tried to uh, make is something that is called a telerobot. Whatever happens inside the eye is being directed by a, uh, a manipulator on the right side. And for the first time in uh, a surgeon's life, you're not operating at a distance, you're operating at the tip of the instrument. And I think even for an anterior segment surgeon, can you imagine being able to work your phaco machine inside the eye instead of being outside? And this is the feel that you get from this. In addition to a lot of other features, for example, if you place a bound, you'll be unable to cause any retinal damage as we've demonstrated here in a, a simulation performed in your retina in uh, 2018. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, using training simulators, it does show that time is somewhat longer, but you do avoid the injuries that I've mentioned. And there are features that are in there, for example, freeze functionalities, uh, the fact that you have a bound, an audio function that tells you when you're getting closer to the retinal surface. And you'll notice that there's a difference in acceptability or the idea of feeling safe. And beginning surgeons, novice surgeons usually like all of these features. And somebody who's experienced, I, a, a key opinion leader, doesn't feel that it's necessary. And indeed, I don't like the idea, even though I've developed this and when I use this robot, that it takes more time. I can do things faster manually and I've developed the techniques that I need to do it. But there are certain things that, for example, if we're starting to look at subretinal injections, and we have here a simulation that we've created, again, for um, uh, your retina this, pa uh, this past year, you'll see the difference on the right side between manual versus robotic. There's a lot more jitteriness and movement. This has to do with our own tremor. So as we're trying to inject in this model under a, a, a sheet of uh, paper of uh, you are able to create a bleb uh, using the robotic system and it's much more difficult to do when it's done manually. And uh, we show this here also uh, from the Arvo poster where we've used the Zeiss OCT microscope in a cadaver pig model where we've added something so that we can see reflux. So bleb creation manually is more difficult. It was done in 40% of cases but we weren't able to achieve the lack of uh, leakage. So, in, and from our perspective, this isn't really an achieve, uh, we didn't achieve our goals. And this is true for most subretinal injections right now. All of them have reflux. In fact, even if you look at the Luxterna product that has been commercialized, there's an excess present there because we expect this. 
when you use the robot, we're able to create a bleb in 100% of cases. We still get some leakage. We need to work a little bit more on it. So we did achieve our goal in a large number of uh, situations. How does this innovation solve the problem? Well, in part, I've just shown you some of the solutions. It has to do with the fact that it's intuitive, that um, we can provide uh, positional stability. It's highly precise and it uh, filters tremor. And in terms of accuracy and precision, yes, if you let the robot carry out a task, for example, statically, it'll be able to maintain it at about one to three microns. If it's able to drive a given motion by using a, a visualization system, it will remain in that same type of uh, um, area. While we ourselves reduce the precision of a robot down to about 30 to 100 microns in terms of precision. And that's despite uh, using um, something to be able to attenuate tremor. So does it uh, change the life of clinicians? Well, we've asked clinicians to try our system and they've all said that it causes less strain. It's more restful in terms of position, causes less stress. And they've all started to think about new solutions, new things they could do with the robot that they weren't able to do before. And the three key features were motion stop, assisted in positioning and task suspension. Task suspension being the fact that you can just look at what you're doing, potentially exchange an instrument, come back to the same spot without you having to give your instrument off to a nurse. You just continue thinking about what you need to do. And for a vitretinal surgeon, that's important. Here you can see the degree of, uh, of filtering that can occur. When you filter, it's important that you don't get delays. So we only want to filter um, a certain degree of, uh, of tremors, so something about two hertz. And uh, as you can see, it does lead to um, an improvement. Does it change the life of patients? Well, we don't have data right now. We're just completing a study in Rotterdam where we'll get patient data with regards to their experience with the robot. However, quite a few have contacted uh, Precise. And when we had the experiment going on in uh, Oxford, the first clinical series, they were inundated with calls. And the first patient had to be delayed and he absolutely wanted to be operated by the robot and was absolutely enchanted by it. So I think we are accepting more and more that you know robots can do things for us. And I don't think it's going to be a problem. I think for patients, they'll certainly be willing to accept it most likely in the same way as we accept flying in a plane today where a pilot is still in the uh, pilot seat. But we know that if you're flying, it's really a computer that is flying the plane. The last question is not so much whether I'm excited with it, but why should this innovation not excite you? After all, here you are, you're operating, you have your device next to you, you have a critical task you want to carry out, or maybe you want to automate partially cataract surgery. So why wouldn't you want to use something that is able to take the jitteriness we have on the right side, bring it to what we have on the left to less than five microns of motion and uh, be able to allow you to carry out tasks. In cataract surgery, for example, because we have such stability, we could go through a tiny incision, get through a tiny incision in the, uh, in the uh, lens and probably do, do a very, very precise lensectomy. And with regards to vitretinal surgery, I've shown you subretinal surgery, uh, we can do epiretinal membyl peels. We can exchange fluid, uh, even though we're not able to see the optic nerve. And I can go on and on, but I think I'll stop here. Oh, this is, this is really wonderful, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. My question is, uh, as a refractive surgeon, maybe all other attending people may, uh, may not be a retinal surgeon. Uh, which retinal diseases can be used in this uh, robotic surgery? I understood uh, making injection, uh, but which disease is uh, this is retinal, intraretinal, subretinal injection, whatever intravitreal injection, which disease well, is? For intravitreal, it's not so useful, although there is a device that has been uh, developed in, uh, in uh, Zurich that would allow automated injections. The device itself has been sold to Chinese from what I ex understand. So it's, going, it's now Chinese technology and probably has a good place over there. Uh, the problem, and so we are developing it still. We've used it for injections in subretinal hemorrhages. Uh, we've done epiretinal membrane peels. We've looked at doing air fluid gas exchanges and uh, we're trying to optimize right now subretinal delivery because for gene therapy, given the fact that if you want it to be done correctly, you want to avoid an immune response. So you must not get into the choroid. 
in as much as possible, given the cost of development and of producing the product, you'd like to limit it just to the amount that needs to go into that space. So we're very close to that, although now we have a hurdle, we need to convince the drug companies that this is the way to go. Okay, thank you so much. So is there any questions? Yeah, yes, so, so Mark, I can see for very expensive therapies and um, the tremor issue with doing a subretinal injection for even the best surgeon, it being an attractive way to go. But I'm just gonna be slightly provocative to my cornea refractive guys. Um, femtofaco, um, with the head-to-head -head trials, which is kind of a robotic surgery, you could argue. It does a lot of, the, a lot of your FACO for you. When it comes down to outcomes and cost-effectiveness, has not really um, done as well as we'd hoped. What's your views on the future of robot? In fact, John's another potential uh, commenter on this. What do you think about uh, robotics in the anterior segment? So we've looked at it, we didn't get into it. You know, if you develop something, you have to focus. And yeah. um, in some ways I was very happy when Femto came along because our development price right now is 500,000. So we're at the price of what Femto was being sold for. And Femto initially, you had to get to a second table, use your Femto, bring the patient to the operating room table. And we've solved that to some extent. Plus, I think, you know, the future of any technology of this sort is it has to be uh, usable in more than one area. So, yes, I think glaucoma would be easy. Putting in a shunt would be easy yeah. using this technology. Doing part, whatever Femto is doing, we could do equally well. We just need to have a port entry that is stable, and that's what we provide. So, in some sense, yes, I think, you know, Femto, unfortunately, was a, a beautiful robotic technology, but it only did part of the cataract surgery. And it only could do that. It couldn't really do much else. Of course, John may contradict me on that, but that's my take uh, on, on, the, on what Femto was. And yes, it's, we still are looking at development, but we do have a product that could be used for a very specific application today. And cost of development goes down. If, we, if, if this is our start cost, everything else would be cheaper after. Yep. Now, Mark, I've been really surprised, actually, given the use of stereotactic uh, design systems in brain surgery for, for many years. And given the fact that we have an almost spherical organ, which really lends itself to these sorts of procedures, uh, it wouldn't be too difficult, I would have thought, to have robotic cataract extraction, for example. The issues here you yourself highlighted were well, first of all device cost and then secondly professional resistance um you know in uk nurses do a lot of uh, in injections for uh, amd some resistance other countries would find that horrifying what nurses doing these injections really goodness uh, and now we're moving into the era of robotics so i think Robotics have a huge future, especially coupled with machine learning, etc. But what we really have to do is to decide what the cost effectiveness is going to be and where will we meet professional resistance and where won't we and where will it really improve the system. So I, I guess as someone that sort of developed and commercialized a number of devices, that's what I don't understand at present. I can't actually really put my hand on the market and say, that's where we're going to go and that's where this system's really well, I think it's, um, I didn't do, we, I could have gone to cataracts early on and we didn't because it was a mature market. And yes, I expected more resistance and retina made more sense because we, there, it's less predictive and there may be things we need to do. But yes, cataract would be an interesting one. And well, the entry point in anything that has to do with anterior segment is obviously refractive. Yes. So, you know, you're going to look at premium lenses. Um, my vision of the future is uh, if you have a robot system that gets into the anterior segment, why the hell do we need to remove the capsule? Why not just remove the cortex, scrape whatever cells are on the uh, at, at, at interior surface of the anterior capsule and inject an elastomer and give back to people their vision, uh, you know, and their refraction, I mean, their accommodation when they were 20 years old. Absolutely. 
So, yeah. you know, that may be, but the, one of the steps might just be perfect centration using some devices that allow you to see the exact type of corneal aberration so that you get perfect centration. You place your lens inside the bag in a way that you could only dream of today because with precision and stability, you can take your time. And that time may be just 30 seconds as it can be many minutes. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think we should always appreciate this old saying, if you don't need a laser, don't use it. Don't use it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so there's another equation also that is coming along. And, you know, in Switzerland, we faced it about two years ago. The, um, the Minister of Health decided to cut all surgical, uh, ophthalmic surgical fees by 70%. And so... Um. Uh, to tell you this is not the rate we get because it's negotiated with, uh, with all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, clinics and everything else. But the official rate is 70 Swiss francs for a cataract right now. So, you know, I, it costs me more to get a haircut. So my wife does it now. But if that's a worldwide trend, you know, having a device that can do the surgery while you see patients and where you still have to dial in the specifics, a bit like when you do your, your refractive surgery, you know, it may become a, a way of the future. And because it's so miniaturized, you could do it in your office. You just need to have a little bit of a laminar flow to keep it sterile. And um, I think in the future, we'll have systems in our offices and we'll be able to uh, combine uh, whatever we're doing or otherwise a structure that is similar to when laser, when you started to introduce refractive surgery. So that's the same model, John. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm looking forward to board certified robots in the US. 